Turn in your Bibles tonight, if you will, please, to the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel. Now, if you have a problem finding 1 Samuel, if you can automatically stumble across 2 Samuel <laughs> and put it in reverse, you ought to be able to find it. If by the time I start reading and you haven't found it, I would suggest that you just look up here intelligently and try to make everybody believe you found it. First Samuel chapter number eight. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all of the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramoth. Now remember as you read this, Ramoth was Samuel's hometown. So all of the elders came over to Samuel's hometown and they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all of the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to, uh, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. I want to bring a message for a little while tonight, and I was thinking there's several topics that I could use. I'm not going to get to finish this, so this will be part one of at least two messages, because I wanted to get down into these passages of Scripture here between verses 8 and 18, but I will not get there tonight. But I, I want to talk to us tonight, I could talk to us on the change of government. I think you understand where I might be going with that. But but secondly, I might want to call it this, and I was just thinking about this when I was sitting back here in the chair. I might want to call it the old man who still had fire in his bosom. Brother Scott, pray for us. Amen. <clears throat> We have here in these passages of Scripture one of the saddest verses, I think, found in the Old Testament Scriptures. It's about a man who was a very godly man named Samuel. Samuel was mightily used in Israel. And one reason why Samuel was mightily used and served the Lord was because Samuel had behind him a very godly mother. She spent a lot of time down at the house of God. We find that in the beginning chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. And she asked the Lord in prayer and in fervent prayer to give her a son a son that she could in turn give back to the Lord. And she prayed fervently. And the Lord heard her prayer and gave her a little baby and she named him Samuel. 
After a period of time, she took him up to the house of God and left him there for a season. And she dedicated him completely and wholly unto the Lord. God answered her prayer. God gave her a son who at this point in time had been ruling in the nation of Israel for a minimum of 20 years. He had put the Philistines to flight. Uh, he was a teaching preacher, prophet. Uh, he was teaching the scriptures available, the Pentateuch. Uh, he was a, what we would call today, a circuit riding preacher. He was going around from town to town and city to city. And he was judging, judging righteously. God had his hand on this man. And the existence of Israel to a great degree during this period of time came about because of this godly leader named Samuel. God was mightily using him. And after Eli had died, God tapped Samuel on the shoulder to be the responsible representative between himself and the people of Israel. It's very obvious as we read his life story that Samuel loved the Lord explicitly. And not only did he love the Lord, but he loved the people of Israel. Uh, he gave his life in service to them. But I notice in verse number one and verse number five, there's two things said about him which are basically excuses. Excuses, especially by the leadership of the different tribes of Israel. Number one, in verse number one, and it came to pass when Samuel was old, in verse number five, and they said unto him, these are the elders of Israel. I can just see them in verse number four, and I'll say more about this in just a moment. Making their way, stroking their beards, sitting around, talking about Samuel and how he's old and decrepit and he's no longer useful for the land of Israel. And they get word out and they come and they assemble in verse number four. And then on a, an explicit day in verse number five, they say to him, behold, thou art old. Now, as we look at the context of these passages of Scripture, it was not the fact that he was old that they wanted to get rid of him. Now, I realize that age overtakes all of us. I'll never forget years ago, my dear friend, who's now in heaven, Brother Joe Myers, he called me one day and he was he was kind of downcast and it was very unusual for him. He was always upbeat. Uh, he told me one time before he died, he wanted to write a book and he wanted to title it some things I've stepped on on the way to heaven, stepped in on the way to heaven. Uh, he didn't get to write that book. Maybe I can write it. He said some things I've stepped in on the way to heaven. But he said to me, he said, he said, I've had something to happen to me in the last month. He says, almost crushed me. And I said, Brother Joe, what's the problem? He said, we had some people, some young couples to visit our church. 
And he said, I went by to visit with them and they said to me, we enjoyed the service. We enjoyed the singing and we enjoyed your preaching. But we're looking for a church where we believe the pastor will, in all probability, be, th- be there for a number of years and we can bring our children up in a church where they know the pastor from their earliest years, maybe on through the time they finish school and, and they get married and until at least they can get out on their own. And they said, Brother Myers, you're getting up in years. And we just don't want to become a part of a church where there's an older man of God. Now I know that would hurt and I know it hurt him because he said it did. What some people don't understand is that those years bring a lot of wisdom front and center. Most pastors who've been in the ministry for any length of time. They've been through some wars. I had a preacher friend, he's in heaven now. Seems like about all of my preacher friends are going to heaven. But I had a preacher friend who's in heaven. He pastored a church, I preached revivals for him on two different occasions in Greenwood, Indiana. They had taken an old two-story farm, barn, hay barn, and they had remodeled it and they had turned it into a sanctuary. They were averaging about 500 people on Sunday morning and they still had the silo, the big round silo standing beside of the building. And his office was in the silo. And I asked him one day, I said, brother, why did you choose to put your office in the silo? He said, because I have deacons meetings. And if I get in that round silo, they can't put me in a corner. (laughs) Now every preacher has their war stories. But every preacher who's been through the battle any number of years can bring something to the table that can help the people who are in time of need. I see a lot of things now different than I did when I started. When I first started out, you could ask me any question you wanted to ask me. I had the answer. Uh, You could ask me about splitting the atom. I would have told you something. (laughs) But when when it came to the Word of God, Uh, I remember in my home church before I started pastoring, the Sunday school teacher was teaching the book of Romans and he had arrived at the 16th chapter of the book of Romans. And if you know anything about Romans 16, it's filled with helpers' names. One name after another. As well as I remember, there's about 20 some names in the 16th chapter of Romans, Rufus and so forth and on down the line. And the Sunday school teacher started reading the 16th chapter of Romans. I'm just a young guy there in the church. And he bogged down after about the first or two two or three uh, verses. He looked at me. He said, Ron, finish reading this chapter. I did. I didn't pronounce probably 90% of them correct. But you know what was so wonderful? Nobody else knew the difference either. So I just shot in the dark. But we learned some things down through the years. And I'm thankful for the aged people, the aged, you say, preacher, you're getting up in years. Are you trying to pad yourself tonight? No, I'm just speaking facts. I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to sit under some aged men in my home church. Brother, Brother Joe Surrett, they called him Surrett over in the mountains. 
I learned so much under this man who was in his upper late 70s. He came to my home church in an old worn out 55 Mercury. And you've heard me tell the story. You could sit on the passenger side and there was a little hole in the floorboard and you could look through the floorboard and you could see the highway. The springs on that thing were straight. And he asked me one Sunday morning to go with him to the Hoots Memorial Hospital in Yankinville. Uh, he was giving devotions over the intercom system. Back then they would allow it. And he asked me if I would go with him and I said, I'll be glad to. He came by my house and picked me up and we got on what is called Shallowford Road that runs through Courtney. And there was a real sharp curve and he speeded up as he headed towards that curve. And I'm thinking to myself, evidently he hasn't been here long enough to realize this is a terrible snaky curve. And he went into that curve way over speed. And because the springs were straight, it bounced once. And when it bounced up, it was halfway over the center line. And then... He was over on the opposite side and he had these real thick Coca-Cola glasses on. And he looked kindly through the steering wheel like that, got both hands on the steering wheel. We finally ended up in the side ditch on the opposite side of the road. He finally pulled it out of the side ditch, got it back in the center of the road, got it back on the right side of the road. And as he was staring up the highway, he said, you know, that's the third time I've done that. I said, my soul, we may need this hospital before this day's over. But he taught me some things. I have some of his books back in my study. He went to heaven. I helped in his funeral over in Asheville, North Carolina. His favorite author was G. Campbell Morgan, and she gave me several of his books, and especially the book of Acts, he, he had written, underlined the commentary, made notes in it. And I hold that in high esteem because he taught me some things about study. Sometimes I would come by the parsonage and I'd look in his study. Uh, at that time I was working at second shift and I, I would look in his study as I'd go by and it was not unusual to see him in there with the light on at one and two o'clock in the morning. He taught me the importance of study. He gave me insight in how to handle and interpret a passage of scripture. I hadn't planned on going in this direction, but I'll just take another minute and tell you a little more about it. Because I want us to know tonight because a person has age on them in any capacity does not mean that you're on the shaft. It don't matter who you are. If you're retired, you don't have to retire from, from the Lord. Uh, if, if you feel that you want to sit back at ease for a period of time and sit in the rocking chair. I started to say you can rock for Jesus, but that don't really sound good. But you can still find something to do for the cause of Christ. As long as we're eating and sleeping and sneezing and snoring, there's something that we can do for the cause of Christ. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. I said to our officers and teachers and bus workers tonight from the book of Job, Eliphaz asked Job a question, are the consolations of God too small for thee? And we need to raise that question tonight among ourselves. Has God not done enough for us to require us to give our all for him? He certainly has. God's been good to us. And Brother Surratt was in a big way of preaching one time and talking about how the devil can deceive people. 
And he said back over in Buncombe County, over in the mountains, they had a drought. And said all of the green grass was eaten up by the cattle. But they had a lot of broom straw. And if you know anything about broom straw, you don't see a lot of it these days. Uh, people used, I know my grandmother used to go out in the field and get broom straw and take twine and tie it together and use it for a broom. But he said the cows were starving, but there was broom straw all over the field. And said the pastors, or not the pastors, the farmers went and put sunglasses on the cows and the, all of a sudden the broom straw looked green and they ate it all down to the ground. And he used that to say the devil has put his sunglasses on a lot of people. And they're blinded to truth. And what looks good is not good under all occasions. What's bad is not bad, bad under all occasions. But here was a man who was totally dedicated to the Lord early on. And he loved the Lord supremely. And now they are using as an excuse his age to get rid of him. When in reality we are told here, although they use him and use his sons as an excuse, that's not really the reason why they're trying to get rid of him. That's an ulterior reason. Let me tell you why they're trying to get rid of him. Look with me again, if you will, please, in 1 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse number 5. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all of the nations. Now listen closely to what they're saying. We don't want God to judge us. We don't want God to be in charge of us. And Samuel, we're tired of your teaching. We're tired of your preaching. We want some new blood. And the kind of new blood we want and the kind of environment we want and the kind of atmosphere we want is uh, we don't want God to be our king. We want a king like the other nations. In other words, we want those kings that we can see. We want those kings like the Canaanites have. We want those kings like the Philistines have and the Perizzites and all of the Ites. We want those kings over there who worship idols and lead their nation into idolatry. We don't want this God who has brought our foreparents out of Egypt and protected us through the wilderness uh, and who is using you now to secure us and to bring our freedom. We don't want that. We want to be like the people around us. And it broke the heart of Samuel. The Bible says in verse number six that it displeased him, and rightly so. They said, Samuel, you're too old. We don't want you anymore. All right, let's just take a few minutes from the Bible tonight, and let's let the Bible teach us and show us and reveal to us whether or not he still had some fire in the stove. Notice with me, please, if you will, in your Bible, if he, let's, let's learn, let's find out if in fact he was capable of still leading this nation. Let's see what he's doing on the other side of this. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the 10th chapter of the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel has anointed Saul now to be the king. That's what they wanted. That wasn't God's choice, 
but he was the people's choice. And Saul didn't do so well. Saul stood head and shoulders taller than the people around him. Saul had all kinds of problems. But God gave him the desires of their heart. And he gave them a king that was not best for them. God had a king. And God was going to give them a king. And he eventually did so. But not the one they wanted. And not even the one the king's dad wanted. But Samuel said to Saul after he anointed him in chapter number 10, verse 8, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Now move over to the 13th chapter. Let's see if this man still got some fire in his belly. This old man. Uh, this old man. Let's see if this old man, uh, they said, we don't need you because you're too old. You can't lead us. So in the 13th chapter, of the book of 1 Samuel, the Philistines by the hundreds and thousands are coming up against Israel. And the people of Israel are going AWOL. They're looking at this large conglomerate of foreign soldiers from the Philistines coming towards the soldiers of Israel. And in verse number 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 13, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. The soldiers of Israel and the people of Israel looked out at the thousands of Philistine soldiers coming against them. And they said in so many words, we don't stand a chance. And so they start running. They've gone A-W-O-L. They're not going to stand and fight the enemy. They're going to run from the enemy. They will not confront the enemy. Because they believe it is a hopeless cause. But they did have enough sense to realize that if they would take time to offer up an offering unto God and bring God into the equation that victory might after all be on their side. So they're waiting for Samuel to show up. Now I read to you a while ago, he said, go to Gilgal and you stay there for seven days and I'll come. And so the enemy is coming in. They're saying, help, we need God. Isn't it amazing in times of emergency, people who under regular circumstances don't want anything to do with the Lord, when it looks like there's insurmountable Evidence that things are going to get worse instead of, instead of getting better. They want to take time to call out to the name of the Lord. I saw a sign years ago. It showed a schoolhouse. And it said something like this. In case of nuclear warfare, the ban on prayer has been lifted. It's amazing, I've heard and read stories of atheists who when they found themselves all of a sudden in an unusual critical situation, they said, oh God, help me. They didn't want anything to do with him when things were going well. And here's Saul 
trying to set up a spiritual service so God will push the Philistines back. And I want you to notice with me in verse number 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. You remember? We read in the, uh, back in the 10th chapter where he told Saul to go to Gilgal and wait seven days. And now Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people, people were scattering from him. Now just because Samuel didn't show up at the exact moment they thought he ought to show up, Saul took the situation in his own hand. Now God had set it up that the king could not go in to the holy place and the king could not offer up offerings unto God. God had set people to do that, eventually the Aaronic priesthood. At this particular time, for 20 years, God has used uh, uh, Samuel to go in around from city to city and judge them and teach them and minister to them. And, Saul, uh, and Samuel has been busy and he said, I'll see you in seven days. And when seven days elapsed and they see all of these Philistines coming against them, Saul disobeyed the man of God. And notice what he did. Verse number nine. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. That was not his place. That was Samuel's place. But the king stepped out of his position to assume the position of the man of God. And the Bible says, watch this, about the time they completed the offering. Verse 10. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Now what does that mean? It says something like this. He goes out to meet Saul and in so many words he said, uh, Samuel, I'm glad to see you. God bless you. I appreciate you coming, but you really didn't have to hurry to get over here because I've already taken care of the sacrifice and I've already led the nation in worship in this crucial hour. Let's see if this old man has got anything left. Verse number 10, it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering, the burnt offering, Samuel came. Verse 11, Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me, and look at this. Saul was always good and a specialist in blaming somebody else for his problems. And I'll show you this in just a moment outside of this setting. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me, uh, the, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. Look at this. I force myself. Saul is sounding more and more like Baptistic. Oh, he said, I just forced myself to have to do it. 
And he sent an offer to burn offering. Let's see if this old man has got anything left. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. Thou wouldest the Lord had established the kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. This old man that they wanted to get rid of said to Saul, the king, when he stepped out of his position and assumed the position of a priest and a prophet, he looked at him and he said, I want you to know, Saul, you're finished. We don't need you anymore. And your kingdom is going to be taken from you. That don't really sound to me like he's so old he couldn't make decisions. I mean, let's just face it tonight. It takes gall to stand in the presence of the king and point his finger at him like Nathan did to David and say, you're finished. You went against God's program. I'm the prophet. You're the king. You stepped out of bounds. Just want you to know you're finished. Thank God when we have some people in the political world, that when we have people in the political world that step aside, there's somebody that can come up and say, that's not right. I'm supporting a candidate down in Davidson County for school board. A certain person in the county has demanded that this person come into that person's presence. And that person wants to, wants to place their approval upon that candidate or their disapproval upon that candidate. And my friend has refused to go and that person is trying to do all they can to tear my friend down. But it makes me want to support him even more because he's got a backbone not to be controlled by somebody else. That he's willing to stand up on his two feet, on two feet. Samuel was willing to stand. But I want to take it a little farther here, and we're circling the field. I'll land shortly, but I want you to see something. I want you to notice me in the 15th chapter, please, of the book of 1 Samuel. I want you to notice in verse number three, Samuel is in the presence of Saul and he's getting ready to make a statement. There was a time when the children of Israel was coming through the wilderness and unsuspected the Amalekites attacked the children of Israel from behind. And God said, I will remember this. And now Samuel goes to Saul and says to him about the Amalekites, chapter 15, verse number 3, Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, calf, uh, camel and ass. Now, I want you to notice what the key is. Verse number three, utterly destroy. God said, I remember how they attacked my people in the wilderness. Now, Samuel says, Saul, <clears throat> their vengeance has come front and center. I want you to utterly destroy them, all of them, all of the people, all of the animals, destroy all of them. And I want you to notice in verse number seven, and Saul smote the Amalekites. Verse number eight, he took Agag the king of the Amalekites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Wait a minute. 
God said utterly destroy all. But notice, he spares the king of the Amalekites. But not only that in verse number nine, but Saul and the, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the, the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge that they destroyed they destroyed the worst, but they kept the best. Wait a minute. God said through Samuel to Saul, utterly destroy him, save nothing. So God lets Samuel in on what's happening. Verse number 10, then came the word of the Lord to Samuel. And Samuel makes a visit to Saul, this old man. In chapter number 8, they want to get rid of because they don't think he has the power and the authority to rule. This old man gets direct. By the way, the thing that makes the difference is he had contact with heaven. That's what makes the difference. And Samuel rose up early, verse 12, to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a place and he's gone about Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, blessed be thou of the Lord. Wow. Well, praise the Lord. I've done what you told me to do. I've done what God told you to tell me to do. I don't know how much more stupid a person can be. He knew better. Blessed be thou, the Lord. Watch this. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I've done exactly what you told me to do. Utterly destroy. And Samuel says, what means the... <laughs> there you go. That is so good. Come here. <laughs> what means the bleeding? There you go. What means the bleeding of the sheep? If you've done, Saul said, uh, Samuel said to Saul, if you have done what I ask you to do, what's the sound I'm hearing? Watch it. What's this sound in my ears? And what's this? And the mm, I'm a farm boy. I can't get the sheep down, but I can get the cattle down. What is this I'm hearing in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now watch how Saul passes the buck. And Saul said, they. Saul's in charge. He said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sanctify them. Lord thy God. And the rest... Look at this. We have utterly destroyed. Oh, he said, we've destroyed a bunch of them, but they, even though they was under his charge, under his domain, he said, they have spared them. Saul said, I had nothing to do with it. Watch this closely. In verse number 21, Saul said unto Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Aag, the king of the Amalekite, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But look at verse 21. But the people. Oh, it wasn't me. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. 
And Samuel said, watch this closely. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. This old man still got it. He said, Saul, I'm going to tell you again, mister, you're finished. And Samuel said, I'm going to do what you don't have the backbone to do. Verse 32. Then Samuel, then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. In other words, Killing's over. Samuel said, I shouldn't say this. Samuel said, you want to put some money on it? Samuel said, you want to bet? And Samuel said, as thy sword has made women childish, so shall thy mother be childish among women. Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. This old man that they want to get rid of has taken care of business. This old man said again, Saul, you're finished, mister. And I'm going to finish the job you didn't have the backbone to do. Wow. Wow. Let's come back in closing to the eighth chapter. I want you to look again in verses, not again at this, but the same truth in chapter eight, verses 19 and 20. When they said, we want you to step down, old man. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, but we have a king. We want a king over us that we also may be like all of the nations that our kings may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel, we don't want God to be our king. We want these nations to be our king. That sounds so much like some of the things I know about, things that I hear. Well, we're tired of the old hymns of the faith. Amazing Grace had its time in church history. Mansion over the hilltop used to be okay, but we're beyond that now. We're weary of the teachings about God. And I, and, and I can hear him sit there. We're weary of the teachings about God. That's the way the liberals think. Uh, we like the things of the world. We're tired of hearing the story about how God delivered our forefathers out of the wilderness. We're tired of Samuel's teachings. So in verse number four, the, I call them the social hypocrites showed up. All of the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and they came to Samuel. What a crowd. I can see them sitting around like they used to do the old country store with a dip of nothing, with a chew of red man. I can see them sitting around 
Who's going to be the spokesman for getting rid of Sam? Who's going to tell him he ought to step down? We're tired of that preaching. We're tired of the old time way. We want to be like those other kings in the world. What a crowd. There was people of Dan. You have these set forth in and out of the chapter. People of Perga, Samaria, Judah, Benjamin, Reuben, and Simeon, Gad and Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, elders from all over Israel. They have come to sit down with Samuel. And they said, we want a king like the heathen Amalekites have. We want a king like the Canaanites have. We want a king like the Phoenicians have. We want a king like the Moabites have. We want a king like the Syrians have. We want a king like the Assyrians have. We want a king like Philistia has. We want a king like our heathen neighbors. We don't want the God of heaven. We want to be like the world around us. We want to live the way we want to live. We don't want to act the way we want to act. We're tired of Samuel. We're tired of God. We're tired of the teaching. We're tired of the Pentateuch. We're tired of all of it. We want to get rid of it. And in verse number six, I'm finished. It cut the heart of Samuel deep. He's from the old school. He didn't want to see his nation destroyed. He didn't want to see the nation turn away from God to serve idols and be like the kings around him. He was cut to his heart. I'll raise the question tonight to all of us and then we're going. What do we do when we find ourselves in a critical situation like this? How do we handle it? Samuel has been the faithful man sitting in the saddle, leading the nation of Israel toward God for all of these many years, brought up in the house of God. God had his hands upon him. And all of a sudden they come to him and say, Samuel, you're too old now. You need to step aside. And it crushed him. What do you do when you face similar situations? How do you handle it? And I want to tell you, some people don't make it. Some people cave. I know some people completely out of the ministry because it got too rough for them. You don't get into the ministry because it's easy. We serve the Lord because we call, we're called. And we, say, we stay in the saddle. But there's going to be downtime. And you're going to have downtime in your life. And you may have some right now going on. There may be something going on right now. And you've raised the question. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, let me point you to the answer. Simple but profound. When they said, Samuel, you're too old. We don't need you anymore. Verse number six. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. When you find yourself down, instead of talking to Alexander Graham Bell, dial up King Jesus. It's amazing that you're not going to tell him anything he don't already know. But since he's known it from all of eternity, he has, he's had all of eternity to, perfect, to prepare himself for your event. I'd say he's had enough time to prepare himself that he might just be able to handle it if you turn it over to him. I got a God in heaven. I like what Dr. L. R. Scarbo said years ago. I'm finished. I know I said that. I'm finished. I like what L.R. Scarborough, a professor at a 
Southern Baptist institution years ago when they were straight, it was a gun barrel. He said, God still has poultry that's never left the poultry yard. He's still got rocks that's never been tapped to the rod of Moses. That's right. Ephesians chapter one, verse number three, he hath already blessed us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's given it to us, it's there for us. It's in the bank. We just need to make the deposit. It's amazing what God can do. I was thinking about something in my own life just this week. I stand amazed. An old country boy coming off of a poor land farm. And God has been so good to me. Let me tell you, he's been better to me than I deserve. God's blessed me. In spite of me, he's blessed me. And I got a sneaking suspicion everybody in this building tonight could rise up and say he's blessed me. Where are we at? Where's our allegiance? Do we seek his face? You say, well, I've been praying and the answer hadn't come. Keep on praying. It's on the way. We need some more Samuels in the pulpits and in the pews and in the chairs. They'll say like Joshua of old, for me, as for me and my house, we're just going to serve God. I mean, I made up my mind a long time ago. When I took my first church, the devil did everything in his ability trying to stop me and kill me. And I just said, devil, you might as well go on back to hell. I'm not stopping. And God still allows me to stand. And I intend to stand until he calls me home. And I hope you're willing to do the same. There's nobody in your life tonight that ought to be as important as the Lord Jesus. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If you need to make your way to this altar, just come on. Give it to him tonight. Whatever it is, give it to him. Get rid of it. Turn loose of it. Turn it over to him. Let him have it. He can handle it. Doesn't matter what it is, God can handle it. Turn it over to him. We're singing a stanza. If anybody else needs to come, just come on. Let God speak to you tonight.